and please make sure that you um, silence your cell phones. And then I'm going to have Katie uh, introduce all of our speakers. Awesome, thank you. Like I said, we're with Deloitte here. So thrilled to be here with you tonight. Hopefully the pizza is going to help you get through this next hour um, that we're going to spend together. We're going to talk about ethics. Um, before we do that, we've got a lot of Deloitte folks. So I'm just going to have them stand up and introduce themselves. Um, if you want to hang out and we'll get to know them a little bit afterwards, um, that way you kind of know who you might want to go talk to. So we're going to start. Vince, do you want to kick us off? Sure, but I won't be around later. That's fine. Later. That's fine. <laughs> I'm Vince Tagudis. I'm the managing partner at Deloitte in Memphis, and I'm in charge of tax for Tennessee offices in Memphis and Nashville. We have a representation of people from various cities here. Yeah. Great. Hey, I'm Tracy Giles. I'm a um, second year tax consultant in Nashville and school here on this. Um, I'll be around later there. <laughs> I'm Sarah Catherine Gordon. I'm also a tax consultant in Nashville and I also went to school at Ole Miss. Hi guys, I'm Kayla Cassidy. I went to school here as well and I'm from the Nashville office. Yeah. I'm Kevin Murphy. I'm one of first year uh, in the audit practice at Memphis. And I did my other graduate class. Hi, guys. I'm Lindsay Dunn. I am in the auto <coughs> practice in Memphis as well, and I will be the So, so far, I'm the only one that didn't go here, but I have a home here. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you say hotty toddy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, Kelly, I think you're next. Hey, I'm Colleen. I'm um, I went to school here for undergrad and grad school. I'm in Nashville, and I'm in the audit practice. The healthcare industry. Hi, I'm Caitlin Child. I'm a second-year senior in the Memphis office. I'm uh, Leonard Schlegge, uh, second-year uh, tax consultant in the Nashville office. I went to Michigan State University. <laughs> <laughs> Not the bad NSU, right? right. <laughs> and, uh, my name is Morgan Dyer. I also went to school here for my undergrad and graduate degree. I'm in the Memphis office and I'm a first year tax consultant. Hi, I'm Paige Williams. I'm not for a moment, so <laughs> I'm like everybody else. Um, I went to Tennessee. I'm in the Memphis office. I'm tax year two. I'm Rob Kinney, uh, Memphis office, first year senior, uh, graduate from here in 2016. And I'm Katie Barber. I did not go to Ole Miss either. I'm the recruiter for Deloitte. Um, I know I've met many of you, see so many familiar faces. If we haven't met, if you want to know more about Deloitte and recruiting opportunities with us, please let me know. I'd be happy to give you my info. Um, we're just, again, really excited to be here tonight and talk to you about ethics. So I'm going to kick it over to Rob to start us off. Howdy, y'all. Excited to have y'all here on this fine Wednesday evening. I know y'all are all eager. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about ethics, and I think a lot of people have kind of different, I, when we think of ethics, we kind of have a little bit in our own head of what that is and what that means. And really just want to talk about it from a professional standpoint, a lot of supplies here in the life as well. Um, so ethic, so it's the discipline of dealing with what is good and bad and moral and duty and obligation. So, um, so this is talking about, I mean, what's going to govern your daily actions. So, and moral. Um, in there. <laughs> so when y'all think of uh, ethics and morals, what are some things that y'all think about? Just like daily life, you're driving down the road, there's a stop sign. What are you going to do? You know there's no cop. Why? That's what you're supposed to, right? There you go. So ethics is not doing what is easy, blowing through the stop sign. Um, ethics is doing what is right. So why are ethics important in an industry like accounting? Um, in, in accounting, um, our reputation is everything. So whether you're a lawyer or anywhere else, um, trust is a huge factor in everything that we do. And if we are supposed to be protecting capital markets by um, auditing companies and looking at their financial statements and trying to provide some sort of assurance to the capital markets that nothing is materially misstated such that it would mislead investors, right? Um, but we don't act with integrity in what we do with how we deal with clients and how we deal with with uh, with the, the readers of the financial statements. Um, we lose that credibility and that trust, and that's essential to everything that we do. Um, so you're not just an employee. Um, 
you, you're responsible um, in a lot of ways for maintaining the public image of the company and of yourself. Um, you were talking about the, the trust and confidence. <laughs> Currently, um, you know, there's, we're starting to see an increase in the scrutiny applied to service industries and audit and tax being, being uh, two of those. Um, it's really making sure that we're not just same as last year, we're not just looking at it as this kind of perfunctory thing that we're just going to blow past, that we're actually looking at it and uh, maintaining professional skepticism and really looking at what's happening with discernment and applying our skills and understanding what's going on. Um, this is coming from the PCOB, um, zero tolerance by the SEC PCOB for these types of infractions. Um, again, public trust, social responsibility. Um, what, really what we're trying to do is get uh, ensure the accuracy and confidentiality of information. <clears throat> so moving towards, towards the regulatory framework. Um, so we have, we have a lot of different regulatory bodies that we deal with all the time. You've got the NCPA, PCOB, um, and then there's other independent st uh, standards boards that we, that we work with. Um, so we're working with public companies, obviously we're working with uh, the SEC, PCOB, and uh, maintaining standards uh, that have been applied with Sorbanes-Oxley and all those very exciting things in terms of controls and dealing with all of that. Um, so, excuse me. so the character, characteristics of ethical dilemmas. So I, I know that at one point in your life you, you felt this, where you've seen something, you see, you hear these things, these sayings that feel kind of dry, but it's the see something, say something, or something that you might see in an airport or something like that. But it could be something where uh, you see somebody uh, cheating on a test in class, or you're cheating on a test in class. And it's one of those deals where like, hey, that's a dilemma. You know, you feel like you shouldn't be doing it. And there's a reason that you feel like you shouldn't be doing it because it's wrong. You know it is. Um, so you're torn between two things. You're torn between passing the test because that's what you feel like you're here to do. But um, you should also need to be doing that in the right way. So there's a couple things. It's kind of funny. I always think about this. Um, people have said, hey, ethics is, is doing the right thing when no one's looking. Um, or, okay, how would you feel if, like, your mom saw this? Like, well, my mom's here. I would not do that. Well, then don't do it. Like, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the kind of thing. Um, and the billboard thing. So a lot of times what we... Um, some of the things that we've talked about before, like in our trainings or at the firm, is like, what are you doing on social media? I think I might be pushing the slides here a little bit, but um, what are you posting? Are you posting something that you shouldn't be? Uh, are you saying something to potentially uh, expose your client or any sort of confidential information? Elevators, keeping your conversation confidential um, and not spreading information that you're not authorized to, to spread. So. When you join the workforce, wherever it is, um, it's definitely your responsibility to consider your personal independence considerations. Um, do you have insider information that you shouldn't be using? Don't use it. It's pretty simple in that regard. Um, but also, like the expectations for ethical behavior. If you're a CPA or you're working in some capacity where someone trusts you to, um, to put together information and, and, and perform a service for them, you need to understand that um, that trust comes with responsibility to act in their best interest and to also um, protect their information. Um, and so also, too, just from a standpoint of if you have a CPA license, you can lose it for these types of ethical breaches. So as far as ethics and actions, we have a couple uh, dilemmas or examples that we're going to talk about. It. Okay, let's get up here and walk us through the view. So here's our first scenario. It's you and another staff are out after work discussing your work. You don't ever mention the client's name. Staff A is discussing the company's initial public offering and the tight deadline because the company was trying to take advantage of the market and get the highest share price possible. Um, they talk about how the long hours are tough and it seems like the manager isn't getting through her reviews timely. And then staff B's discussing how aggressive the client's being and that some of their accounting, albeit in not so significant areas, appears to be overly aggressive as well. 
and some of the items being capitalized down up here to actually benefit future periods. And then staff A agrees and indicates that they have been working on some reserves and it is strange how they have consistently declined in the two years leading up to the IPO and the client appears to have appropriate support as, as to the declines, but it seems like they were too high several years ago. So now we're just gonna have you guys answer or come up with what you think is ethically wrong in this situation. So gonna need a little bit of participation. So what's the first thing you guys notice was wrong with this? Pushback if I have any questions on them. 
uh, you can definitely bring it up to your manager or partner even if you can't get a hold of your manager. Um, uh, whoops, I'll just skip the next question. But, <laughs> So that's what the staff should be doing to address their concerns. Um, and then what if both the manager and the partner push aside the staff's concerns? What do you think next step, steps would be? You go back to work and just say, okay, everything's fine. <laughs> Tried my best. So most, fir most firms, I assume all of them, have an ethics team or someone where you can escalate higher. You may think the partner's your last resort, but they're not. They have bosses as well, shockingly. <laughs> well, I was going to say, we're talking about it in the context of public accounting, but yeah. most large companies are going to have some sort of ethics. Uh -huh. We'll leave. Yeah. So there's a compliance yeah. hotline. I can tell you all the all the big four, and so even the second tier firms have. I'm aware of it. That um, in this situation, if you came to me and you said I've got a problem in this area, I don't understand what we're doing, and I feel uncomfortable. So one thing I will tell you, even though you're young, is typically in the audit world, or probably even the southern tax, our clients trying to do something aggressive with tax on the tax. If you feel like it's wrong, even if you don't, you can't kind of put your finger on it, 90% of the time you're right. Your instinct is right. It's something that's fishy about it. It may not be totally wrong, but it's still probably something that you look into. So you came to me in this situation and I said, I may, let's say I was unethical, and I'm saying I don't care. They're going public, we're going to pay $5 million, get out of my office. I don't care to do that, but if I did do that, your recourse is, you would call a hotline and it would all be anonymous. And you would have to say, I'm uncomfortable with this situation. Or it could be, this is the wrong answer too, that I already know the answers. And, and this would be very bad, right? But I just don't have time to tell you why I think all this is okay. And so I'm just, because <laughs> we're all working long hours, I'm saying I, I'm good with it. Don't worry about it. I understand your concern. We'll catch up. That, that's the wrong answer too. So you, you always got to. Feel uncomfortable in any scenario, you need to reach out for help, whether it's within the engagement team or outside. Probably a good time for the mom test. But don't call your mom and tell her this because that's secret. <laughs> They'll be like, I thought you did tax. <laughs> <laughs> Extra flights, 
to maximize the points, and I miss the client meeting. But it happens, right? It's travel. Layers don't always go as planned. I mean, that's, a, that's just kind of how it works. So Barry and I kind of talk about it, and I'm explaining, hey, look, I'm only charging the normal time. I'm not doing anything over. In fact, I'm saving up some money with these flights. They're cheaper. So I don't really see what the big deal is. I mean, yeah, I mean, some points, and maybe that's not the best thing, but it's only happened once. So Barry and I kind of talk about it, and he says, you know, well, let's flip the script a little bit. What if the client had found out that the reason you missed this flight was because you've been booking all these non-direct flights, and you just have to get stuck in Milwaukee? Milwaukee's got bad weather, you should have known this. Milwaukee's not that great of a place to hang out. Like, what's the deal? So, Barry and I kind of talk about it. <laughs> You said the right answer. Right 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm walking back here. Yeah. Now you're going to carry on three. Jump ahead. So, does that kind of make sense? I mean, we start out thinking, you know, great, I'm going to get some double points. I'm going to save the firm money. We're going to come in under budget. This is great. It's a win win for everybody. But it's easy to see how a situation like this can quickly turn. Um, Case in point, the client finds out that this is why you missed that meeting, which by the way is probably a very important meeting. Um, you can understand their angst and, and anger to a degree of, of what was going on. Um, so it's kind of one of those things where you had to think about it, it's the mom test. Um, if mom would not approve, or if she said, yeah, I don't think I would do that in your shoes, then don't do it, don't do it. Um, you can kind of play the, the worst case scenario in everything that you do. You know, if I make this, de this decision, what is the worst case scenario? This outcome. Um, if that puts you or the firm or your coworkers, whoever it might be, in a tough spot, that's probably a good thing to reevaluate what you thought about. So, so what would have been the, the appropriate thing to do, probably on the front end, as opposed to the back end? The direct points. Yeah, that'd be sure. But, but even having, goes back to communication too, even if you were talking to the engagement partner or manager or senior manager say, hey, I'm doing, you're at least getting up from advice as to whether I should be doing or not, as opposed to just going down that path and then being consequences of that. Right? So I think the thing to remember, right, in this profession, um, no matter what function they're in, consulting, tax, audit, we're, we're in the client service business. And our clients kind of expect us to show up for meetings on time. Um, because they are very busy people, even probably more so than we are, and they're paying um, extremely high fees and rates per hour for us to be there. And so um, I think that, that's the only way you're going to develop in your career and have career opportunities is quite honestly, anything else you do, um, even at my level, as long as you've got clients and you're taking care of clients, you're, you're, you're going to be safe and have Does anybody have anything else they want to add? I think we've got one more, and Lindsay's going to take care of that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So to give here, I probably shouldn't call Memphis, Atlanta, Atlanta, Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> probably like the most relevant one to especially all of y'all because we all get on social media and post on social media and like even though like our grandparents don't use social media and like our parents don't necessarily use social media. I'm getting kind of offended. <laughs> <laughs> we carry it. All right guys, it's sticking our skin up. Um, like us using social media will carry on into our work life and like everything like that. So this is the situation I'm in. Um, so I was just moving to another project because I was using, first of all, I was using my personal Facebook account. Like it wasn't like, oh, the look and see. Um, I was using my personal computer, not my the look laptop. And I was like, weekend time, like not the look time. And um, I made this post about this city that I've been working in because like it's super duper lame and I hate it. And um, I didn't mention the clock name. I didn't mention the fact that, like, hey, I'm here, like, working for Deloitte on this client. Like, nothing like that. 
Well, one of my coworkers decided to be extra brave and friend one of our clients on Facebook. So, in a roundabout way, one of the clients saw my comment talking about how I really hate this place and how it really sucks. And so, um, basically, you know, it's like completely accurate that I think this is my favorite part. Unless you like cow tipping or train watching, the list of things to do to kill time is kind of lean, unlike the local food. <laughs> So someone got offended over my comment about the city, and then like, I don't think I did anything wrong, like this was my personal time on my personal Facebook, so like if they want to take me to culture court to prove that this place was as desolate as I say it is, then like, I'm down for it. Okay. Um, so, how many people think I'm right? Like, I want everyone to participate. Like, if you think I'm right, raise your hand. <laughs> All right, if you think I'm wrong, raise your hand. All right, good job. Great. Um, so, what is, like, one of the first things that y'all think that I did that, like, wasn't okay? Like, it's super obvious and everyone has the answer. They just don't want to say it. So, someone be brave. Call him. Call him? Yeah. All right. Oh, all right. Um, how about, how about Jill? I'm here. <laughs> um, you were posting about your client on Facebook. You know, it wasn't like your actual client, just like what the place that you were at. Yeah, you're right. So I was posting about a place that like, obviously I didn't like, but like here I'm going to use like the, what would your grandma think? Like everyone's grandma lives in like some small little town that probably isn't our place to visit, but like, what if she was scrolling through Facebook and saw that you posted that about her town? Like, she'd be so upset about it. Like, she loves that there's only two stoplights. Like, so think about that. And then, um, also another thing about small towns is um, some small towns only have, like, one big factory. Like, we, they, like, that's a very common thing for, like, most of that town to be employed by just one large company. So even though I might not have said, like, oh, like, I'm in Starkville, like, I could say, oh, like, these people all work for Mississippi State. Like, obviously, like, that people would know that, like, all, that's where I'm talk, like, talking about. Um, what's another thing that maybe not necessarily I did, but kind of something that you see as a problem in this scenario? Could yeah. Maybe um, someone, like, a staff member being friends with a client on Facebook, because that can kind of seem like an independence issue kind of thing. Yeah. Not necessarily independence, but like it does kind of raise some problems. For example, it just like basically put me out in the open for like with, I made this comment, and yes, it was a personal comment. It did open me up to the scrutiny. So like when you think about that, like it's one thing to like have a friend that works at a place that maybe you're auditing, but it's a different thing to like go add your friend or like your client on Facebook or like accept a friend request from a client on Facebook. Um, this says, like, once a client becomes part of your network, Facebook, in effect, becomes part of an extended workplace, which I think is very accurate. Um, and then another thing is, is, so, how many people put, like, oh, well, I'll show you right now. I did it. So, I started, like, three weeks ago, and I was like, oh, I got to go to Facebook now, and I work at Deloitte. So, I went, and I was like, work at Deloitte. So, like, literally everyone on Facebook knows that I work at Deloitte. So even if I didn't say I didn't work, for, like I didn't say I worked for Deloitte, I didn't say what client I'm on, but I'm making nasty comments like that, like that's like a direct reflection of like my company. I, like I would attribute this kind of like the same way Greek life is, like people like harp and harp and harp, like don't put anything up that like you don't want to, <laughs> to represent your organization. So I think about that in like the same kind of sense. Oh, let me make sure I cover all of um, okay. I think one thing too is kind of important to note here is that it's not so much the issue about the area of grievances because there there are times where you might be doing work that is not your favorite. Um, it's more of the method of how it's communicated. Um, so if you find yourself in a situation where you are in some code on town, you're not enjoying it, or it's just the work, or maybe it's somebody you're working with, 
Um, there's ways to communicate that. Yeah. This is obviously not it, but it's kind of important to keep that in mind. So. Yeah. yeah. So you probably got yeah. uh, 10 minutes of something really good, right? Could have lashed out <laughs> social media to me. Yeah. And then this person, I believe in the example, was like an A performer, right? Got pulled off the account because of this. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this or not, right? Probably the or the person who is already a friend with the individual Facebook client, that's probably not a good idea. Probably didn't help that situation. Yeah, I was just thinking about the fact too, like that conversation that the client had with like your partner or your manager saying like, hey, like, look, like someone on your team made this really rude comment. Like if that, you that you wouldn't want to be that person that like kind of difficult like conversation. So it's like you like don't put someone else in that kind of position. Because um, basically they had two options. It was like, oh, let me just fight for this person even though they said something super duper rude to you or just like kick them off. So, and ultimately that's what happened to me. I got kicked off. <laughs> All right, Barry, you going to wrap it up? Um, I don't know. I apologize for being late because I was taking care of my clients. I was actually going to come to see you later. I was getting ready to say the same thing. So, you know, the one thing I would I would tell you, I don't know how much how much Rob and the team already covered, right? Is this is um, more important today than ever before. I mean, ethics and integrity in everything that we do as a profession and as a firm um, has repercussions, probably even more so today than ever before. There are firms, once you lose your brand as a firm, or let's just put it, turn that on its ear, once you lose your personal brand, right, it's it's really hard to regain that brand, whether it's as a firm or even a person. I mean, you think about people form opinions, initial opinions about you every day, just from leaving you or what you put out on social media, they automatically form an opinion, and then you have to overturn that somehow, right, or work hard to do that if, if you're so inclined to try to do that. So I think in today's world, <clears throat> with social media, everybody's connected 24-7. Um, I mean, I'll tell you, I've got a 16-year-old son, and two years ago, he had friends up in his room, and they were just messing around and stuff, and we found out something was put out there, not by him, because I would kill him, <laughs> but by one of his friends. And it's like, buddy, you don't, you don't understand, because it was kind of weird. <laughs> this, this is there forever. It, it will be there forever. I mean, it, it will be there forever. It will probably come back. He's applying to colleges. I'll be shocked if that's not something they find. It, and it's there forever. It does not go away. It's the same with email, instant messenger, which we use all the time, face anything you tweet. I mean, it does not. It is there in perpetuity. So. Um, Keep that in mind if you, if you pursue, finish out your college career and pursue um, going into this profession. Because we are, right, if you think about it, we're kind of the gatekeeper and the audit side of the house. We're the gatekeeper of the audit of capital markets. And everything taxed to us from signing returns to consulting, compliance, everything has to be of the utmost integrity as well. Consulting advice on the consulting side, we've got to be able to stand behind that. We can't lose our brand in that function for specialization. Is everything we do has to be is held to the highest standard. Personally, probably other than the medical profession, we're probably held to the highest standard of any other profession I know of, including the law. I think we're held to our highest standard in the law. Because if something goes wrong, they're 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 coming after us, just like they do with doctors. Um, so with that, um, we have parting thoughts. The one I've always used, I know we use this in the firm all the time, but I may already say it. Just I always when staff come to me with these dilemmas, and so we actually talk about this. We actually have a some of these were pulled off the void pad because there's a guy out there that we call Doctor Dilemma. <laughs> So, did y'all talk about this already? I, I, I did not mention Dr. Moore. Okay. <laughs> so, actually, these situations, there's hundreds of these things out there. So that when you guys run into these situations, you actually go out there and say, okay, what, I'm thinking about doing this. So, if you don't immediately feel comfortable talking to a manager or partner, because I know it's hard 
you guys to communicate these <laughs> You can go out and ask Dr. Dilemma and they'll, you know, you can find these things, these situations, and they'll give you some advice. And so the one thing I always live my life by is I don't, anything I do today, it doesn't always work out this way, I'll be honest. Anything I do today, I don't want to get up the next morning and read it in the newspaper. And in our profession, right, you never, you never want to be in the business section or in the Wall Street Journal because odds are it's not good. <laughs> you want to stay out of the public life for all practical purposes. Um, so that's kind of the rule I've always kind of lived by. I don't know about you, Ben, but that's kind of the rule I've always kind of lived by. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's from a, uh, there's no, there's, may, maybe it goes along with being an accountant. There's never like a bunch of good news. Look what Deloitte did, great. It's only, if there's something reported, it's gonna be, look what Deloitte or the accountants did wrong, and so you just don't wanna see your name. Yeah, you're not gonna see, <laughs> you're not gonna see front page of Wall Street Journal say, Vince Magooda saved this company, you know, $10 million because of consulting, tax consulting advice. Barry Atkins and his team, you know, audited Bridgetown Americas, they got done in under 5,000 hours, and it was, you know, <laughs> expected by the PCAOB, they didn't get any comments, that, that's not gonna hit, that's not gonna hit the press, man, it's just not gonna get there. But, but if five of our staff go and do something and post it on Facebook, it's on there. <laughs> and your Facebook account is linked. I mean, Lindsay said this, and everybody knows you're an employee at Deloitte. I mean, it, it, whether you think it does or not, it impacts it impacts the company you work for. And then buried from another social media side, have y'all seen this big four accountant, like Instagram mm -hmm. thing? Some of it's a little too relatable. <laughs> um, I, I particularly enjoy like the short course with all the, the documents coming that are broken references and the rest of it. Like, that's, yes, yeah, this is all our stuff. Um, but that is a really good way to, to really screw some stuff up because like I've seen pictures on there where like it's late that the client people are being goofy and they're like they're like some sort of like relay race putt putt deal and like oh that's fun and all but goodness gracious like I actually know of one of the, someone I know at the, at my client actually like follows good work out I think it's hilarious. But could you imagine if your client sees y'all working there and it's like they have a deadline that's about to get pushed and they're like wait I thought y'all were y'all working so it's just a great because you might be busting your tail and you just took a twenty minute break. But for all they know, this is what you've been doing. You've been working on your short game, and it's just like, <laughs> and so it's just really good. Just don't do it. Just follow it like it's fine, it's all good, but do not push yourself doing something stupid. But unless the mindset's And yeah, we're not, we're not, I don't want you guys to take this like, I mean, we're not saying you can't have a personal life whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Right? You just got to be, in this today's world, you just have to be so, I mean, I would never survive. <laughs> I mean, what my parents would have found out about what I was doing, I would have been in so much trouble. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I'm just being honest. So, you guys are under a lot heavier, you know, magnifying um, microscope than anybody, any, any generation before. So, you, have to, you just have to be smart and keep that in mind. I have a question. You're not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> I kind of thought about that. I was like, can I ask a question? And then I decided, like, if he tells you no, you can call the ethics hotline. <laughs> Dr. Dilemma. Now, here, let me give you my cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, Lord. Um, have, like, have you ever found yourself in an ethical situation? Like, I mean, I'm sure you have. You've been working for a long time. So, like. <laughs> <laughs> Another grandpa <laughs> reference. <laughs> 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 And can you tell us about it with, without violating an ethical dilemma? <laughs> Even if you don't use the Um. Yeah, I probably should have been used that Yeah, so um, I can give you a couple of examples. I, I have been in a lot of weird situations. Mm -hmm. Probably why I have a lot of gray hair or something. Um, so I was probably a second, second year staff working on a small bank, financial institution, and doing um, loan testing. And 
I was one of those guys, you know, we have some up in the firm now. Uh, there are certain people, like when they do samples, they just always hit the one that's freaking wrong. <laughs> and they just do. So I was one of those people. So I came across a loan that um, I recognized the name, and it was actually a partner with the firm in another office. I knew from the recruiting process. And um, I mean, obviously that's not right. We shouldn't have loans with our clients, period, whether they're publicly traded or not. And it was at a really good rate of interest. <laughs> um, and so yeah, I had to, I escalated it to the senior manager. The senior manager who is, obviously neither of these individuals are still with the firm. Um, the senior manager kind of pushed it to the side a little bit, so then I had to escalate it to the, at that time, we didn't have it because <laughs> it was 30 years ago. So I had to escalate it to what was then referred to as the regional managing partner with all that function. So, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't think I was going to have my job, <laughs> but you just always have to do the right thing, and that's the one thing. And all the firms are that way. But, uh, Deloitte. Um, it's one of the reasons I've stayed with the firm so long. I think we always, I mean, we will we'll fire clients that we think they're doing something incorrect. No matter how much they're paying. You said you're a second year? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't get much sleep for <laughs> about four weeks. I had I was, I was newly wed and had two, two young kids at home. Yeah, I was pretty. Pressure cooker situation. And as a first and second year, like, you're going to be the one that's going to find it more than likely. You're going to you're, you're in the details. Well, you're you the one that knows the details. Testing, yeah. You see the invoices and everything. So it's, just, it's got a cool opportunity because you actually get to really apply your skill and look at it and try to find it. But not every little mistake is like fraud. <laughs> <laughs> I found that out. Like I said, this is this is wrong. Today. Other questions? How are we doing on time? What time do we start? I was told we have to cover exactly 50 minutes. Or more. Or more. Yeah. Are there other questions? Another quick question. Like, how do you think outside of your control affects you know, the trust of maybe your firm or your profession? Like, kind of like what I've seen with like the PTOB recently and their internal troubles, like is that you think that kind of stuff affects how people look at accounts or is that oh absolutely. You mean like the their inspection results of the firms that they publicize and right. Well like recently they had that um they have pronounced they're like auditing thirty percent less audits and stuff and there's a bunch of like power struggle stuff. I don't know if that was a uh, oh, within the problem. Is yeah, it yeah, I call it <laughs>
clients or potential clients, we lump it all together and say, well, we'll just, we need to stay outside of the big four because of uh, the regulations. And, uh, we're not going to post it to the PCAO. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, so yeah, it, 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 it has had a, a, a drastic impact. I mean, we all take our, our bombs, but right, there's a reason. You know, to your point, to elaborate a little bit, there's a reason there's the big four and there's everybody else. The big four are all most of the public companies, obviously, so for the ones with the heavier volume of inspections that are occurring. Um, I think it does go in cycles, to your point. We, we were, if you want to call it fortunate or not, or not you know, peekaboo or, or auditing standards and their oversight, you know, came to talking about brand, you guys, so many people are probably born, yes. So um, you may or may not remember the firm called Anderson that lost their brand overnight. I mean, it was done. They lost their practice, their license to practice in the state of New York, and, and they were finished that week. I mean, it literally happened within 48 hours. If you can't practice in the state of New York, I mean, think about it. Most, all your financial institutions, most of large businesses at that time yeah. were in the tri-state area. Um, and so we were, we were somewhat fortunate that when you call it picking on or not, I do think there's been a lot of improvement since then, especially in the area of internal controls. And more, more than that, I think it has, had, it has made management take more responsibility for their financial statements as opposed to putting it all in the audit firms because they have to sign certifications now to go into their SEC filings. But we were the first one, right, wrong, or different, that kind of got beat up pretty bad by the PCAOB. Back in the, the mid 2000s, 2005, 6, 7. Um, and we, we, we had to institute a, a lot of policies and procedures to rectify that situation. And I think we're in a very, very good place with the, the regulator at this point. They actually seek our advice. So as opposed to us being at odds ends and arguing with them all the time, they actually call us now and seek our advice, which is, I think, exactly where we want to be. I think all the firms were in denial in those early years. Like, who's going to tell yeah, us? Yeah, why are you telling us? <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, it's, it's arrogance, right? But a lot of it was like, you guys never made it in Big Four, so you're working for the government. Why, why are you telling us? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the way it was. All the firms were taking that attitude. It was just the wrong attitude to take. <laughs> because that's a losing battle. They're still your regulator, and they're going to be your regulator. It does not matter whether they're smarter than you or not. <laughs> they're your regulator. So anyway, well, I don't know if I answered your question, but all the firms have kind of gone through those cycles. So it, it does have re repercussions on the profession as a whole. We we do not want to see. I don't think any of the firms want to see damage done to any of the other firms that purchase as a whole. Others? Yep. Um, so for some of you like first year and second year staff, have you guys had any like ethical things that you've noticed? I know a lot of people haven't like just kind of started, but Did I need to leave the room. <laughs> <laughs> or like something where like you like had to pause and think like what should you do? Because I think as students like we're gonna be in your spot like pretty soon. So yeah. So um, last week was like my first week out of training, and my very first assignment was in the right now never done one before, was going by myself, like had no idea what I was doing. The team that was in charge of it was out of New Jersey, so like I had to communicate with them and go do it. And it wasn't really, I guess like, it wasn't as big of like an ethical dilemma as what you get these kind of situations, but it was just kind of like a, I was the only one there to handle it, so how do you kind of handle when something comes up? And you know, we're going through trying to make selections, and the client was like, okay, well here we're gonna make these selections, and it's just kind of like, trying to figure out what to do in that situation. So I, I did that. I was like, I don't know like exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, but afterwards, um, like I just called the team. I was like, hey, all right, like this is what happened. Like, is this what should have happened or what should have happened? What can I do? What do I need to do now? And they kind of talked through it. Um, and so it was just kind of more going back and forth with that client to get more information. But like in that moment, it was just like, okay, what the heck do I do? This is literally my third day out here. Like, what? That was literally the only thing I was like, that's it, that was not <laughs> um, But like it all worked out, it was fun. 
but you are going to probably, I mean, there's a good chance many of you will have that same situation. You're not going to do one pretty early on. Um, and, you know, the client is like sitting there telling me stuff, and I'm sitting there like, I, you can be telling me anything right now, and I could believe you. Like, I don't know any different. Um, but just kind of go in with that mindset that it's okay if you need to, like, step to the side and say, hey, just give me one second. Like, I need to get a call. I sit here and make sure, like, I understand what I'm supposed to be doing, or, you know, kind of that having that mindset of it is okay to like take a step back and not have to be the one that the pressure is on and be like okay like I have to make this decision right here right now yeah also one that got brought up a lot whenever I was attorney one week which has happened to me and I've never heard personally someone that's happened to is what they call eating hours um so and I'm sure y'all may have heard about it before but like basically like you know when you get put on any kind of engagement tax audit advisor anything you have a certain amount of hours you're supposed to be working that week so like you know when things get busy like what can happen is like oh like, i'm only supposed to work 50 45 50 hours this week but hey like things are really piling up and like um you like i'm probably actually working 55 hours but hey i don't want to like make him upset or like go over our budget or anything like that so i'm just gonna put 50 on there and like you know those five hours are just it's fine like i won't worry about it well, if that happens consistently, that's what they call eating hours. Is you're you're spending five hours of your life that that should have been attributed to your work. Um, so, like I said, I haven't run into that issue, but like that's one of those things where like the my facilitators were like, you should never do that. Like you always put how much you work, and like if you ever come like to a point where your manager, the, whoever's directly over you, is like, well, you know, just put the e work nine hours today even though you just got clock in at 11 hours that's when if that like happens like that's when you go talk to like your partner or something like that um because that, that I mean, will not be tolerated yeah because you, you may be making yourself look good because you're saying oh, well, i did this audit area and less hours than what was in the budget but but it doesn't give us a, a fair estimate of, of, of the value of our work and we're to build a client and what we're putting forward and, and it's just not, it's not right into the period. Your first year's gonna be a problem this year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They think that it's gonna be, oh, they first did this in 50 hours, and it really took you 120, but. Yeah, then the next year when they get bad things, you're just gonna go out on Facebook and say, they will, they just suck. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just a vicious cycle. <laughs> yeah. Something that can sometimes present itself as a, as a dilemma. Uh, I think one of the things that, about these dilemmas, it's kind of good that you have an ethical by that I mean if you don't think it's a big deal that's much worse than, than actually seeing it um, if that makes any sense like if it's not if something isn't a dilemma to you and it should be that's a problem um, but, right, exactly. no so like if you, if you if you find yourself in these things don't think that you did something wrong to get there I guess is what I'm saying but you know when you're going through support I think sometimes in, in audit uh, specifically uh, we kind of have it it can be a backwards feeling incentive, right? So we, we find if we find an error or we find some sort of exception, uh, we don't get a bonus. You don't get a bonus. Like, good job, you found something wrong. You, you, a lot of times you get more work. And so sometimes if the audit can be, if it's later in the engagement, so you find an error, you have to make 10 more selections and go through this process. But you're looking at it and like, it's not that big a deal. This balance isn't going to be that big a problem. And you're like, well, let's just round out that invoice because $5, who cares? We you should care, um, and so it's that it's it's making sure that you know you, you put in what you see, and if you don't see it, that's not your fault. You just have to go find it and figure it out and have that desire to get an answer. So, yeah. one that I faced, and I haven't been there like two months so far. Um, that happy hour one, or the you're out drinking and you're talking about your work. That's okay. It will be like it's just inevitable. It's so hard. You've had a long week. And all you want to do is talk about how you're so annoyed that this client is doing this, this, and this. You can't do that, though. So that's it's what hard. I've already like seen and kind of had to let Yeah, that, that second scenario was like my whole, or no, the third scenario. Where you're, you're in a city where it's not great. Um, I spent my whole first year of my career in Detroit. And I never set foot in the Detroit office. Um, they were like, you're going to Flint. So I was like, everybody knows about Flint, right? The water, still can't drink it. <laughs> still can't drink the water in Flint, that's a true fact. So I don't have social media just because it's just 
just a big minefield of risk. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so but it just goes back to like when I would like talk to my friends about it, I'm like, you don't have any ni any nice things to say. Um, just don't say anything. You know? It's like you know, what I mean? yeah, it's just really simple. You know, when you, when you think about it. Or just make sure they don't have any friends. Yeah. <laughs> anything in that city, <laughs> and then go. That's kind of a that's why I didn't bring mom up. <laughs> my mom <Yeah>. come <laughs> But she's still my mom. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you.